Good morning and uh, welcome from Vicky and I as we begin another uh, season of online church. Uh, hopefully this won't continue for too much longer, but uh, we're really praying that uh, although we can't physically meet and worship and learn and uh, uh, a fellowship together, that nevertheless in this season God will be at work in us and among us uh, and through us. And that when eventually we do get to gather together once again, that we will be rejoicing at what God has been doing uh, amongst us. You probably realise by now that uh, we're focusing in these next few weeks on the book of Nehemiah. And uh, we've had the first chapter of the book read to us, uh, and Joe has set the context and given us some of the, uh, the background uh, to this story by way of introduction. And now we're going to go through this incredible prayer of Nehemiah in this first chapter in a bit more detail and try and get inside it a bit and perhaps try and get a little bit of uh, what was going on in Nehemiah's heart. Now one of the challenges of preparing a somewhat shorter talk for online church is what do you leave out? It can actually take longer to prepare a shorter talk, surprisingly enough, than just to you know, share everything that you feel God's given you. Uh, and it's always tempting just to let a talk run and run, but I won't. By comparison, Nehemiah does something bordering on the miraculous uh, in this passage. He takes four months of pouring out his heart to the Lord God and distills it into seven short verses in this book. At the beginning of Nehemiah, we're told that Hanani returned from Judah in the month of Kislev. And in our calendar, that's kind of November, December time. Uh, and then in chapter 2, verse 1, we find he eventually gets to present himself and his cause to King Artaxerxes in the month of Nizan, which is kind of March-April time by our calendar. So that's four months of weeping, of pleading, of praying, of pouring out his heart to the living God. Now I can imagine if, as Nehemiah is, is kind of writing this account and looking at these seven verses uh, from verses 5 to 11 that he might be tempted to add a bit more. You know, oh, there was this, this revelation from God. There was this time when, you know, I really felt the emphasis of my prayers was in this direction or that direction. To try and give something more of what was taking his, his attention, his energy, his focus during these four months. Giving him sleepless nights, causing him to miss meals. But I guess these verses at the end of the day do capture the heart, the essence of his four months of prayer. Interestingly, when Nehemiah eventually gets to make the journey from Susa to Jerusalem, it would probably have taken him about uh, three months or so uh, to, do, to do it. And we'll find out later that in spite of some fierce opposition, it would take them only 52 days, less than two months, to build this wall around Jerusalem. Uh, to make the city safe once again, to begin to restore her reputation and her identity as the city of God. This is an amazingly short period of time for any significant building project, especially though using unskilled labour, volunteers. But without the four months of prayer, the three months journey, I believe, would not have taken place, and certainly not with the blessing of the, uh, the great King Artaxerxes. And this 52-day building project I, I suspect would have taken years and years and years. It took a man of prayer, uh, a man who would pour out his heart to God to bring this to fruition. And the reality is that when, when the living God has been engaged by his people in heartfelt, persistent, God-inspired prayer, the result is fruitfulness. Things get done, they get finished, uh, even in the, in the face of opposition. Before we begin to look in more detail at this uh, lovely prayer of Nehemiah's, it's just good to, to focus a little bit about the man himself. Firstly, just realising he was actually a man of prayer, that there are nine prayers in this short book. In fact, one commentator reckons there are 12 prayers. I haven't sort of gone through and counted them all myself. But this is a man of prayer. But also, he was a man of God's word, a man who knew the covenant scriptures this prayer is rooted in the covenant promises of the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. But there are other influences as well. Some of the commentators see hints of Moses, Solomon, David, Jehoshaphat, Daniel and Ezra in Nehemiah's summary of his prayer. This is a prayer rooted in the promises of God, as we shall see. The essence of Nehemiah's prayer is that something needs to be done if the people of God are to be restored to be a nation once again, living a life of worship to the Lord their God, 
focused around this once great city of Jerusalem. And so two things need to be addressed in this prayer. Firstly, the spiritual restoration of the people of God. The restoration of relationship with the living God. And secondly, the physical restoration of the city of God. The rebuilding of its walls. This will require money, materials, manpower and woman power, as we'll find out in the next few weeks. But it will need also the permission, the blessing of the great and powerful and somewhat unpredictable King Artaxerxes, who, who Nehemiah literally serves in his presence uh, as his kind of personal wine waiter. So how does Nehemiah begin his prayer? He starts with these words in verse 5. Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. He starts in the best place ever with God himself, who he is, his character, his nature, his greatness, his power, his faithfulness, his covenant of love. Isn't this just the, the very best place to start any prayer for the living God? It's the way Jesus taught his followers to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed, holy is your name, gazing on the living God. Whatever the issue, no matter the immensity of the challenge, the urgency of the crisis, the best place to start in prayer with who God is, with God himself. This is the one who announced himself to Jeremiah in uh, Jeremiah 32 verse 27 as I am the Lord the God of all humankind. Is there anything too hard for me? This is the way to build faith in prayer. This is where our prayers are sometimes actually reshaped and reformed. We go to God with one thing, our hearts burdened with one issue, but find actually as we come to him and look upon him, the, the thing changes, the issue changes, uh, and we find ourselves praying about something different. In the presence of God, sometimes I realise the prayer I was coming to him with isn't really the issue at all. And I wonder if uh, Nehemiah might have begun uh, his prayer, his season of prayer, with the intention of praying against the enemies of Israel who had kept Jerusalem a vandalised ruin, despite the attempts at the uh, early returnees to, to kind of rebuild uh, this city. It actually managed to rebuild the temple. I mean, a, a kind of poor imitation of the great temple of Solomon. But nevertheless, the temple was now there in this city. But their attempts to rebuild the wall and, uh, and make the city safe again had failed. The wall was once again broken down and the gates had been burned. But as Nehemiah begins by praying, by, by gazing upon the living God in his prayer, this God of the covenant of love, his prayer becomes something of sorrow and repentance. First of all, he really pleads with God to hear his prayer. This is really coming from his heart. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. Please listen to me, God. Please look at me. See how much this matters to me. And then, not a prayer against the enemies of God. Not a prayer for money or materials to rebuild the city. Not a prayer for restored prosperity for Jerusalem and Israel. But a prayer of repentance. And so he continues, I confess the sin we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees and laws you gave your servant Moses. This isn't a prayer now about a city and a wall. It's about a people and their relationship with the living God. The condition of Jerusalem, broken, defenceless, devastated, is just a picture of the spiritual condition of the people of Israel who had broken the covenant of love with their God. It was a symptom of a much more serious deadly underlying condition and so Nehemiah's prayer needs to address the cause rather than the symptom. Nehemiah recognised that this wasn't even something he could blame on the, on the generations of, uh, of long ago, those who had actually gone before and, and had committed these dreadful crimes and sins against the living God. After all they were the ones who had not followed the ways of the Lord, who had rebelled and hungered after the things of the nations around them. 
who had done dreadful, wicked, unspeakable things, sometimes in the name of the living God. He could have pointed the finger at them, but he didn't. He knew in his heart of hearts that he was as much a part of the problem as any of those that had gone before. He knew the scriptures. He knew that he had to take responsibility for his own part, his corruption, his lack of attention to the great commands that God had given through Moses, his lack of love for the Lord God, whose covenant was founded and grounded in love. You might think that realising the seriousness of, of his situation, in a sense realising the, you know, the filthiness of his own life, his own need for repentance, how badly he in, in some way in his heart had wronged God, that he, might, he wouldn't even dare to approach the living God, that he wouldn't dare to come and bring these needs before God, but rather perhaps he should run and hide as far from Jerusalem, this place of God's judgment, as possible. But there was more in the scriptures more in that amazing covenant of love that gave him confidence and gave him hope. And so he continues, Remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling place for my name. Nehemiah knew that there were consequences for not following, not keeping their side of the covenant of love. The amazing thing was that this, this word of God didn't just stop at the scattering, at the judgment of the wayward rebellious people, but there was hope. The scripture Nehemiah is quoting in this uh, prayer is found in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 to 10. This is a, a beautiful uh, passage, uh, a promise of restoration. There isn't time to go through it this morning, but I'd encourage you, if you get the time uh, later today, perhaps, to read these verses. The thing what God, what was that God knew that this would happen. He knew Israel would ultimately fall so low and rebel against him so, so desperately, uh, badly, that, um, that he would have to banish them from the land he had so generously given to them. He knew that Jerusalem would have to be destroyed. The temple, uh, the place where he was meant to dwell, would be pillaged, desecrated, and demolished and yet he offered a way back his covenant of love was strong enough uh, to overcome the weakness and the rebelliousness of his wayward people and so Nehemiah knows from these precious scriptures that there is a way back to the Lord for Israel and this is true for us too there is always a way back to God no matter how far we have fallen, no matter how much we've let him down, no matter how, how far we've wandered, and no matter how many times we have done all of these things. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus, his suffering, his blood shed for us, there is a way back, a way of forgiveness, a way of returning to the living God, to a precious relationship with him again, as cleansed, forgiven children of God. Nehemiah finishes his prayer with a, a, a reminder to God that these people he is praying for are numbered amongst your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. The Lord God had delivered the children of Israel from captivity once and he could do it again. And then he finishes his prayer with another cry to hear him, to give Nehemiah his full attention because now it is time to address the immediate challenge. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favour in the presence of this man. And so this short uh, summary of four months of prayer finishes with a prayer for favour from this man. At the end of Nehemiah's prayer, the great king Artaxerxes, the human obstacle, if you like, to the, this, uh, this building project that, uh, that needs to be embarked upon, is no longer Artaxerxes, the great king of Persia, all-powerful, uh, unpredictable, uh, and not to be messed with. But now, in the face of the living God, in the presence of the living God, he's, he's just a man, this man. So why is this, uh, this book of Nehemiah still so important to us two and a half thousand years later? 
The thing was, Nehemiah was about to embark on this great building project, and we ourselves too are invited to participate, to be uh, part of the, uh, another more significant great building project for the living God. We too are called to be builders. The New Testament talks about Jesus being the cornerstone and capstone of his great building, the beginning and the end of it. In Ephesians 4 verse 12, there's a, a verse that we've been looking at uh, recently on the Wednesday evenings uh, that talks about uh, equipping his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And in 1 Peter 2 verses 4 and 5, he writes, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. And there are many other passages in the New Testament where we, where we get this sense of God building something, something beautiful, something precious. And this project that we are engaged with is actually more important, more enduring, uh, more beautiful and more meaningful than a wall around a city that one day will just actually get uh, demolished once again. And so as we draw to a close this morning, just want to summarise three lessons I believe we can learn from this wonderful prayer of Nehemiah. Firstly, that our prayers always begin by remembering who it is we are praying to. And let this living God that we approach in prayer inform and reshape and refocus our prayers always towards him, always towards his kingdom and his purposes. Secondly, let's learn to build our prayers on the word of God. One of the most powerful things we can do is to simply pray the Bible. And thirdly, this wonderful good news that no matter how far we have fallen, how far we have wandered, how much we may feel we've let God down, there is always a way back into relationship with the living God. If we sincerely return to him, taking responsibility for our actions and saying we are sorry and really meaning it, then there is a certain and sure way back through the precious blood of Jesus. And just one final thought. God is looking for building blocks and not stumbling blocks. And I'm conscious that although for me personally I want to be a building block, I want to be part, a, a positive part, a, a, a contributor to uh, uh, what God is doing, there are times when I can be a stumbling block. And so an encouragement to pray for one another. Uh, pray for us as leaders uh, that God will help us and use us. Pray for all of us that God will uh, help us to be uh, a precious and beautiful part, a functioning part of his great building. Amen. Thank you for listening.